stuff off, so yeah. it was much more fractured in that before. So it's lasted quite well this time. No, it's corrugated iron. Actually, it's yeah, yeah. Well, it's well, well, it's a kid, it was everywhere. Yeah, well, it originally had a peg tile roof, and if we hadn't replaced it with that corrugated iron, which was in the late 1800s, yeah. then the mill probably wouldn't be here because the one or two tiles would have snipped, the rain would have got in, right in all the timbers, and everything been beyond repair basically. Normally there's, in previous years, there'd be four or five of us here by now getting stuck in, but uh, we're struggling for volunteers now. All the volunteers I've got are all part, well past retirement age. Take that off, redo it, yeah, yeah. New screws are old. If you can use the old screws, great. If not, new ones. We're trying to rough them up a bit so they don't look too shiny, you know. Okay. Well, other people say, right, what we have to do with these new screws is try and hide them where we can so they're not seen, so it don't look too obvious it's new. Uh, or scuff them up a bit and let them go rust the outside for a week or two first. <laughs> things like that, just to say it looks in keeping with the... Yeah, know, yeah, and try not to use any modern aluminium and things that millers wouldn't have had in those days, you know. Um, but he's good because you can just tell him to get on with it and he'll come back quite often he surprises me saying, right, what's next? Have you done that? Yeah. Do you want to come out with it? Alright. Oh, right, he's done a great job of that. And he just whizzes through things because he's quite practical. It's, 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 I mean, it's great satisfaction doing that sort of work. I mean, all the stuff we're doing here is going to last. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, pops and it's on all, all such like simple technology as well, so it's great to see now. Like, it's also a mixture of technology. You know, the gears, the wooden gears. I never thought about, you know, I've always thought about being cast metal and things, that combination of, of different technology and stuff. Mm -hmm. You always hear people talking about, oh, we, we got really good once the Industrial Revolution come along. Um, you know, steam power and all that. But all those engineers then would have struggled if they hadn't had the work of all mill rides before them working out about levers and pulleys and gearing and gear ratios and the size of gears because that work was already done and down. So all they had to do is say, we need to move this amount of weight, this distance, what sort of lever or what size pulleys do we need to accomplish that? Whereas if they had to do it all from scratch, we, we might have had the Industrial Revolution 100 years later or something. Because mill rides, 
had no plans, no architects, they just took what materials were available locally, made a building that can stand the wind or stand the water power. Um, just amazing when you think about it, really. Amazing, you know, hundreds of years. Now, anything you want to be built, you go and consult an architect, a structured engineer, and they've got all the figures and calculations. So those guys back then had nothing, and they just had to, you know, right, we want a briefly timber, let's make it bigger <laughs> rather than small, just to be able to say so. And a lot of these timbers, you can see, all got holes in them, and where they've been reused from different, some of the wood the hair came from an old ship. Yeah. And you can see old peg holes and mortise holes in some of the timbers, where they're all been reused from something else. Yeah. We've been, uh, the older parts of being in there and yeah. the, the, the beams you can see the slots where yeah. it must have been reused. Yeah. You know, I think there's a fantastic history there. Yeah, that's that's right. about, yeah. about reusing that, that kind of technology. And also, you know, the amazing thing. And, and then, you know, the amazing thing is that the amazing thing is that Back because you could hardly see it from anywhere because it was all overgrown, and then re whitening the actual cross with, with uh, hydrated lime. Yeah. And the mill manager from here was one of the two, along with a chap called Christopher Barnes Wallace, who was the son of yes. Barnes Wallace, bouncing yes. bomb paint. Yeah. And he yeah. was just as ingenious and inventive as his father. Um, first thing I saw was he pulled up, opened up this car, all these bits wood came out and planks and wheels and they assembled this looked like a, a medieval trolley thing with a, it was a, a big u-shaped piece of timber with a cross handle on each end that the wheels fitted onto and then wood went on top of it balance at either end and we loaded all these bags of lime onto them and david who was the mill manager for me said i'll go ahead and wreck the route and you lot get ready to come. So he went off and kind of said, right, the first bit's straightforward, it's nice and flat, but then we've got to bend some tree roots. And, and so, right, stop there, come on, look, we've got to keep to this side, away from the roots, but not too close that we hit the tree. And we walked and didn't through the woods, that was a carry on for a start. That's fantastic. You've been doing for a long time. Yeah, yeah, yeah I've yeah, been doing wow. the children's society for a couple of years before I come down here. Met David. He stopped us after about 10 minutes and said, God, you seem to be one of the only ones who's following instructions properly. <laughs> he said, all the others, they're waving it about and most of it's blowing away. Would you mind, I want to stop the group, would you mind giving me a demonstration of how it should be done? Yeah, okay, fine. Said, right, stop work, everyone. Watch what Chris does. And the secret was to get it on your shovel and just blow on the ground. So it all goes on the ground and doesn't blow away and builds up the depth. They were just sort of out of the bag and like this. So it spread around, not a depth, a lot blew away. When we got to the end, he said, right, we're, we're packing up now. He said, well, I wanted to catch hold of you. Um, Christopher and I are going for a, a bite to eat and a pint at the local pub. Um, not asking anyone else, but you seem quite practical and you did the work well. Would you like to join us for a pint? I said, okay. Not knowing David like I knew him afterwards, but he was already grooming me for the mill. Oh, this chap's quite practical, got a practical background, follows instructions. And he was grooming me as a volunteer for the mill, even at that point, I didn't know. We went to the apartment and asked him, have you ever heard of Fall End Water Mill? I said, no. Do you know anything? Oh, yes. Uh, and he said the farm. So the farm rings a bell. So is that the chap down there does motor repairs in a outside unit. That's it. The mill's just behind. Alright. So, no, no, I know the windmill. Well, well, I'm the manager from there. And if you'd like to pop down and have a look one Sunday, I'll show you around. I said, alright. Arranged to come the following Sunday. We got here. And since I got here, showed me around. And then, what, what skills do you have? I said, well, I've trained as a motor mechanic, but done to be most practical. Can you weld? Yes. We need some welding to do. We're desperate for a welder. So I agreed to do some welding for them. Came back, I think, a week later or two weeks later. Oh, that's brilliant. That's perfect. It's just what we want. Would you be able to do anything with this? Yes. Yeah, so I took it away. Came back the next week. 
Could you do the opposite one? Because we've got two pairs of stones, so they've both got the same piece. Could you do the one? Yes, I did that, came back the following week. So I've come about four or five weeks in a row by this time. And then as we were leaving on the last time, he said, right, see you next Sunday then, Chris. I said, why? What do you want me to do for next Sunday? He said, oh, haven't we got you interested enough to come and join us now? And I said, well, sort of. But, you know, I don't know if I'll come every week, you know, every Sunday, but I'll come when I can. He said, oh, well, next few weeks will be interesting because we're removing all the furniture and lifting the stones up to inspect them and clean them. And we'll get to see a bit more of the nuts and bolts of the mill. Oh, that sounds good. <laughs> so I was there for the next few weeks, and then after that, I was just part of the team basically. Uh, that was 2000. We got to 2005, and David announced the final meeting that he was wanting to retire as mill manager. And I was there was uh, another chap, John, who'd been here with David about 15 years prior to me. Another chap, Bob, who'd been here six or possibly eight years prior to me turning up. So at the meeting, I almost switched off because I thought it's going to be John who's second in command, uh, you know, takes over because he's second in command, or Bob, who's both been here a lot longer than me. And I was like, well, Chris, uh, sorry, sorry, I was just uh, well, what do you think? I said, what, about David retiring? No, about you becoming mill man. I said, me? He said, yes, John's in the same position as me. He's getting too old to do it much longer. Bob lives in Buckingham and he doesn't always make it every week, whereas you're only in Tring and you know the mill very well now. I said, I don't know. I don't know enough to take over and be the manager. And David said, I'm not going anywhere. I just haven't got time to take on the responsibility, but I'll be there to guide you and coerce you along, which he did for the next, well, he died a couple of years back, so for the next 15 years he was still there in the background, ringing me up. Have you organised the week? Yes, that's all. Have you done this? Have you? The first few years, and then just let... I think, right, when I see Chris this weekend, if he hasn't mentioned anything about buying wheat or ordering wheat, I, I better remind him. <laughs> and I'd say, yeah, I've been on to the farm. Oh, good. I was going to ask you about that. But he got to the stage where, first of all, he'd push me a bit. Then he'd sit back and wait for me to suggest. And then he basically said, I can retire now. The mill's in good hands. You, you know, you've got the heart of the mill now and it's in your blood sort of thing. And, yeah, well, you're so enthusiastic about it. I, I love it. I love the machine. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it looks so simple, but actually, I mean, it's really yeah, great. Yeah, it's, it's quite complicated yeah. when you think about it, but it's all simple how it all works. But to actually put it all together and make it all work as a, you know, a whole is a, quite a thing. Yes, it is. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. We had a problem with one of these bearings recently. And it kept almost st sticking, and then carrying on again, and we couldn't work it out. And it was just the bearing in there, it was just a little, getting a little bit worn, a little bit sitting to one side so I had a little bit of 10 minutes with a bit of sandpaper to even the bearing out yeah. and readjust it to where it should be because well, you can't really pop down to home base to get a new bearing you know, everything no got everything's to be... got to be made yeah we had to get a new bearing made for down there um so we had to go and locate a piece of phosphor bronze lock then we had to find an engineer to rid it out then we had to remove the old one fit the new one make sure it was all right for most of the year I was down here on my own. Um, we knew we weren't going to be opening because of the COVID and the lockdown and everything, so we had a bit of a problem with vibration. And I thought, right, while we're locked down and I'm on my own, I'm going to take everything apart, examine everything in my new detail, to try and get to the bottom of this problem. Uh, it took me the best part of three months, stripping everything down and greasing bearings and cleaning them and greasing again and um, put it all back together, no better. Tried a few adjustments here and there, no better. Um, and I went left one day a bit disheartened, thinking, I don't think I've even made it worse, you know, with all my efforts over the last three months, on my own, in the cold. And, <laughs> and I sat in the pub and had one of those light bulb moments. And I thought, right, just all the bearings have got usually four-way adjustments on them, so you can move them east, west, north, south. And I tried all that way, all that way, all that way, all that way. And I thought, right, I'll do so everything right off. The five different bearings you've got top and bottom up here, top and bottom up there, top and bottom of each stone. Loosen everything off, and I turned the mill about a dozen times just by hand, turned the wheel, let it go round. I thought I'll let everything sit where it naturally wants to sit under its own if it isn't being forced by you know the bearing adjusters. Did that a dozen or so times round, and then just went back and just did the adjusters up just to where they contacted and took up the play and didn't actually move it at all. And just nipped everything up, started the wheel running, perfect. 
my thought, what have I got away with doing this three months ago without having Because everything I took apart, all the bearings all looked fine once they were cleaned up, weren't really worn, had the odd little scratch, but you thought, that's not going to cause a vibration, you know. So I was getting to the end, I don't know what your problem is. I said, well look, it goes round a couple of times, and all of a sudden it goes brrrr, and the whole beam shakes. And it has a couple of revolutions where it's silent, and on the third one it'll be brrrr, a couple where it's silent, and then Oh yeah, but apart from that, your mill runs really quietly. The mill I've been working at last week, you could hardly hear yourself think. Your mill runs perfect. I said, no, it doesn't. I've been here for 20 years, and it's never made this noise, and it's annoying me. I want to get to the bottom. I know it can be better. It's smooth. Yeah, it's running well now. Yeah. yeah. Things, Once you get the millstone engaged, though, ah, yeah, it's got all that up. all that friction behind it of trying to turn the millstone. Yeah. And then that's when the building comes to life. I presume that's why it's good on, on, on a on a on So a it can move. Yeah. So if, it, if it was flex. if it was yeah. solid, I mean, you can get a lot of solid mills, but quite a lot of them are wooden based like this. Yeah, so it's got that. a bit of flex to it. Yeah. And even since I've started coming in, it's tied up at the moment. But this chain used to hang more central in the hole. Uh, now it, it does tend to hang more that way, so it's like the whole building is moved slightly. Mm, that's interesting. And we have to go round every every year before the start of the season, go round and all the nuts and bolts everywhere that you can see. A bit of a you tighten them up at the beginning of the season before you start. But by the end of the season, you go round and everyone will have a little bit of when they've all started yeah. rattled yeah. loose or wears taken place. Yeah. Not to keep on top of, but not to think about. It's a bit of a responsibility at times. Sometimes I go away and think, oh no, I've broken the mill and we're open next week, what can we do? <laughs> and I'm racking your brains all week and we come in on Sunday and a few people got ideas and eventually go, oh, we found the problem, brilliant. But on the other occasion, we've had to say, sorry, we can't mill this afternoon, we've got a you know maintenance problem or a mechanical problem that we can't get to the bottom of and we don't want to run the mill and risk damaging it any further yeah. because then it will be even more expensive. We don't have a great deal of income, but um, just about keep on top of things. That's really good. That's really good. But now I've watched quite a few of your videos now, every now and again. I think, oh, I've done it and I've got to do it. It's still an hour before I want to go to bed, but I've been going around and I've been going around. Getting some more wheat and uh, getting leaflet printed for this year, which I've normally, you know, I normally sit down between Christmas and New Year and I'm bored. I don't like watching television. Um, so I sit down, I go through all the dates. Is there a World Cup on this year or when's Wimbledon? And try and avoid the major dates that when things are on. Um, and then work out like this year we've got the, um, uh, which is a King Charles Nation. That's on the 8th. So We'd like to open bank holidays because people are usually more willing to go out and do stuff on bank holidays because they've got the longer weekend. Mm -hmm. um, so we always like to open them, they usually are better opening days. So I need to incorporate that. And then we've got bank holiday on the 1st of May, that one on the 8th. We always have what we call National Mills Weekend in the middle of May when all mills that can open usually do open and if they can mill they're usually milling. Mm -hmm. So there's 300 plus mills that sometimes would never be open all year that are open that. So we always like to be open on that weekend. Uh, and then we got a bank holiday at the end of May. 
So we've got mates. almost May, almost every weekend we're milling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I'm trying to work out all the dates and what doesn't clash. And once we've got dates that we don't clash with other dates to open, then we've got to work out what volunteers are available. And, and each year, we used to have, when I first started, about 65 volunteers. Now we're down to more like 35, 40. Right. Um, so we've got you know, almost half the volunteers to offer their time. Um, quite often, like last year, I had to appeal to the Children's Society, could you put a message in your magazine and on your website that we're desperate for one or two extra volunteers, otherwise we're going to have to cancel some of our open days. Cause we had two dates where I was planning on being on holiday then, the other lady at Mills was away in America working that week, and uh, we could make sure we opened and didn't lose the dates, but we've managed to gain a few volunteers through the Children's Society, which is a new treasure which we've got now carried by the Children's Society. Mm -hmm. um, and they also at the time said, well we can also help with a bit of publicity if you take part in our heritage all through September. They have half a dozen, dozen places but some of them that wouldn't normally be open to the public actually open, but only for a private tour through the Children's Society. Yeah. Where you can book in, and so they said, would you like to do that? And we'll organise a couple of big groups to come and look around, which will be a bit more publicity for you and a bit more income. Yeah. Um, so we did that, and that all went well. We had, uh, I think, 32 people in the first group and 20-something in the second. It's amazing how many people say, I didn't know it was there, because we are tucked away on the corner of the farm. Yeah, yeah, we don't have big advertising yeah. boards out the front. No, if you drive right. past and you're not really looking, there's a sign, but you won't really see it. No, no, you're right, you're right. Well, you says, might see it and just think, like a lot of places, oh, I've been past and seen the sign, the water, but I thought it was an old pub. Yeah. It was closed yeah, yeah, down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I noticed in your newsletter that someone had asked you to mill some special wheat. What was yeah. We often get that, we've done a few over the years. One of them, the lady, she wanted to, she's uh, got a load of land that was part of a farm. And we thought, well, we've got these fields not doing nothing, perhaps we could grow some wheat. So she said, I'm not, I, can't, I'm not, I want to be a farmer basically, and I've grown a load of wheat, I've got three tonnes of it. Um, it's an old uh, variety, heritage type wheat. Um, she said, but well, we'd like to get some of it turned into flour, because everyone we says, says, well, yeah, we might be interested, but what sort of flour does it make? She says, none of the big mills want to do it, she says, so we're now asking places like you, and you're one of the nearest to us. And I said, yeah, I'm sure we could, she wants to do all three tons. And I said, I'm sorry, we literally fill those dustbins, and that lasts us most of the year. I said, we literally use between half a ton and a ton, and that does us all year. I said, and we do that two or three hours on a Sunday, 12 times a year, to, to mill that amount. So to mill three times that would mean three, uh, times yeah, 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 yeah. you know in hours and said we just physically haven't got the energy or the members and volunteers all the time to do it i said but if you want i would mill a small sample for you over a few sundays yeah, yeah. um so we agreed to do i think it was quarter of a ton for 250 kilos and um, they bought 125 the first time which we spent uh from about nine to one o'clock on a sunday really um, it never occurred to me there were different sort of, I thought wheat was wheat. Yeah. It never occurred to me there's different. Yeah, no, it was an older type which they call Maris Widgeon. Um, and it was a bit of a job to mill, first of all, because our grains are, say, this size. And so when you bring the stone down, you know roughly where it gets set. And because it doesn't vary much year to year, it's slightly smaller, slightly bigger, but we use pretty much the top wheat we can get. All of a sudden, these grains come up and they're a third of the size. Ah. So I was coming down, looking where I'm normally set, thinking, right, from here I normally go a couple of three turns or whatever. And it's all coming out, half grains and loads of brown. I was going to, I went down a little bit more, thinking, I've never gone down this far. <laughs> so I stopped, went back and looked, if anything moves and come out of alignment that's making it oh, yeah, not yeah. take up the adjustment. Everything seems fine. Right, well, start up again. We start up. But it's a bit better now. Well, let's go down a bit more, but normally if I'd gone down that far with our normal amount of wheat, we would, the stones would be starting to rub and catch and oh, make yeah, a burning yeah. smell. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was a bit worried about going further. I thought, I'll go a little bit more, but if I smell any burning, then I'm going to stop and say, we can't mill it. I don't know what's going on, but we can't mill it. I went down a little bit further and it started coming out nicer then. <laughs> I thought, right, and then I, when I went to top up, I thought, yeah. Thinking about it, you should have realised because the grains are a third of the size, so obviously you're going to have to come down because they're not physically taking up the space. But um, that's what I was standing there, I thought, there's a slight smell to this, I can't quite work out what it is. And I 
said to the other two chaps that are here helping me, and they both just didn't know the smell. I said, you're right, it has got some, one chap said, it smells so sweet. I said, yeah, yeah, sweetish, yeah. And I came back down, they called me for coffee, and I was upstairs doing something. And as I came back down, I walked past, and I got the smell again. I said, it's almost sort of herby, spicy smell. And no, no, then we sat over in coffee. And I said, oh, I know what it is. It's hit me, it's cinnamon. Oh. And she said, ah, oh, there are some things that grow up. I'm sure she's got little blue flowers on them. She's got, there are some, we worked out these little black seeds that were in there. It's yeah. not cinnamon, but it's related to cinnamon. Oh, it's the same family. Same family, same yeah, family. Yeah. gives you that hint of cinnamon. Yeah. And so I took some flour home and baked some bread with it. And it made nice bread, it, it rose well, and it looked nice, and um, all the texture came out well. But every mouth we've got this background hint of cinnamon, which when I was trying to have a ham sandwich, <laughs> I thought, maybe if you made it as a fruit bread or do it with jam, yeah. it'd be perfect because you've got the sweet, uh, spicy taste, but it doesn't really go with the same. <laughs> yeah, so we do the odd one. We did one there, uh, some artist chap, he um, got involved with uh, the um, Bletchley Park over to Milton Keynes, yeah. and they agreed to give him a bit of a field out the back, and he grew two different varieties of wheat. Um, but because he was artistic, what they did was they left sections in the field to spell out words. Ah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. But you didn't know what they were until it was all grown up and they yeah. could do an aerial photograph. And in one field it had alien, <laughs> and I think in the other it had a picture of like, you know, the standard grey-faced alien with oh, yeah, a yeah. pointy yeah. kind of eyes at the start, <laughs> and, and they had an alien face in the other one. <laughs> They approached us and said, we're looking for someone, we've grown all this wheat, it was a kind of artistic project, but now we've got the wheat, we thought we might as well get it milled and kind of yeah, keep yeah. the project going almost. So we went over there to have a look at these fields of wheat and have a look at it all. And then it was quite good because a lot of the fencing that we've got, they said we put, had to put a fence around it to keep the animals out, yeah. but we've got to take the fence down. And would it be any use to you? We said, yeah, you'll have to come and collect it and take it down and collect it, but you yeah. can for free. So a lot of the fencing was up the side there now, I and mean, around the back there. Oh, it was getting to come free from them. Um, but they got these special um, bread loaf tins made with alien written on one <laughs> and a picture of an alien face. So when the bread came out, she had alien written on it. Um, we did a special milling down there for them, and they advertised it, and we had quite a few members of the public down. That all went really well. Yeah, yeah. Extra, extra publicity it's for us. Up with other groups yeah, things. just connecting up yeah, and yeah, getting yeah, publicity. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, lady opened up the shop in uh, Wigginton a couple of years back now, I think. She got on and said, I'd love to stock your flowers. I said, we don't actually, we only really do it as a souvenir of people's come and visit. Yes. We don't really do it on a commercial scale. So we supply a few extra bags at the end of the time. Once we finish, say, oh, we've got 30 bags left now. We'll have 10 or 15 at the farm shop there and 10 or 15 at uh, Dunsley Farm Shop, yeah. obviously Tesco. Yeah. Um, and they say we would take more, but it means someone's then got to come down in midweek or in between millions to actually mill to keep up with their demand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we go on the basis that we'll give you any surplus, but we can't actually mill yeah, yeah. Foot on demand sort of thing. Um, well, we just the other side of that wall, I guess. Yeah, just the other side yeah, of the wall. Yeah. You can go around over the bridge and see all that and up to the mill pond. Yeah. Big shaft runs through the centre of the water wheel, comes through, turns this large um, gear wheel here, which is called a pit wheel because it sits in a pit. So you can see it sits down the pit there. That then turns what is called the wallow, which is this gear here, which is then turns the drive angle from being that way round to this way round to turn this main shaft. And then everything runs off the main shaft. We've got what we call a spur wheel here, which runs a gear that side when lowered, and a gear that side when lowered to turn the millstones. The millstones this side uh, have been for flour. The ones that side were animal feed. They don't grind it quite oh, as yes. fine, so they were used for animal feed. Um, they're produced as a complete millstone in the Peak District in Derbyshire. Uh, you can still even to this day go to a place called Stanage Edge. I think they've got over a thousand various, just from a, a roughly hewn rock that's sort of roughly round shape to one that's then more of a defined round 
and then the next one it's got squared off sides you can see it definitely and the next one then the hole is made in the middle wow. it's almost like one day so right lads nobody wants these old millstones anymore they've all gone to modern roller steel mills electric mills you're all out of a job there's your way you just go home and they just all stop what they were doing on the production on you can actually go there's one they just dug out the rock as just a big round boulder there's one that's had the top taken off but it's still rough around the outside and there's one where the edges have been smoothed off but they came as complete stones whereas the ones that we use for flour they're composite they're made up of small chunks and held together with big bands of iron and plaster of paris so they were more expensive because they had to be actually made up and put together where the other ones were just basically chiseled out to make the shape. And, and how, how long have these stones have you had them here? These uh, don't know how long the stones have been here because no one's been around long enough. Okay. They could have been here when the mill was originally put together. They could have been replaced at some point in the past, we don't know. But in the history that we have got, which only goes back probably early 17th century start of the eight, uh, sorry, uh, late 8th, late 17th century start of the 18th century is what we got vague records of there's no mention in that time of the stones being replaced wow. but we know the mill from parish records was here in 1616 and that's our official date that we claim as our oldest date because it's verified in the parish records uh, someone wanted to build a house across the road and when they put down for location, it was adjacent to the Ford End water mill. Whereas we've got, there used to be another mill downstream at um, Slapton, Slapton Re Mill. There's also one opposite uh, the what is now the Indian restaurant in Pitstone. Yeah. That had the water before us, then we had it, then it went to Slapton Bree. And plus you've also got the windmill. So there are four mills that have all been called at one point or another Idingo Mill. So, unless it actually says Ford End Water Mill on the record, we don't claim it as, but we've got records going back to the 12th, 13th century, where two water mills and a windmill were what they call quick claims between one lord of the manor and another. So basically they had a deal or some description to swap lands around. We think, well, two water mills and a windmill is more than likely this. The water mill up by the old Bell Pub, which is the Indian now, and the windmill. But because it doesn't actually say for then mill, and then there's a lot of records where they say they worked at Ivano Mill. So we had a chap saying, no, he didn't work at your mill, he worked at a Pitstone Mill. And so for years there was this argument that you claim he worked there. And then we found records where he left working there in the morning to come down and work <laughs> here. And he actually said, no, we're both right. He did work both mills. Um, but trying to find some of the history is quite difficult. So how long the stones have been here, no one really knows. They could have been here going back to the 16th century even, or they might have only been introduced in the early um, 18th, late 17th century. And, and the actual mill pond itself, I mean, with each one of the mills had their own mill pond. Yeah. 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 What's, how far, how, what's the drop? The drop there is about 14 foot, which allows us to have an 11 foot diameter wheel with a bit of clearance below it. Um, I mean, for build, I mean, making that that mill pond back in, in medieval times has been quite a yeah. change as well. Yeah, that's it. So. All, all the stuff they had to do then, without you know, it's all done by hand, no diggers, and yeah. you know, and then obviously there was a, a natural stream had some sort of natural fall with it. They wouldn't have just come along sure. and said, "All right, if we dig that out." We can, <laughs> obviously, there was some slight waterfall, or it came down here for some reason. They thought we can use that to our advantage. Um, but yeah, it's all when you think about what we had to do to get these places running and build the buildings and set up the mill ponds and line it all with clay to stop all the water seeping away. Of course, yeah, because it did all to me, right? Yeah, we had a thing a few years back, we had a bit of a leak and we, we got down there. Uh, the mill manager found some records from going back to the early 60s when they first took over. when. There was a picture of the bank at the back, all brown in the summer, apart from about a metre wide, that started a metre wide that came down and got two or three metres towards the bottom, where it was lovely green grass. So they realised there must be some leak. So they emptied the mill pond and found that there was a bridge. But all they did was just fill sacks with bricks and old bits of rubble, throw them in the hole, and then put a thin smear of clear, uh, clay over the top. Well, years later that clay had gone and it was just seeping through the rubble. Um, the landlord told us he wanted to have the mill pond drain because he was starting to rent it out to the local angling club for fishing and they complained it wasn't deep enough. So 
So he had the mill pond emptied and dredged and all the stream around the farm. Um, we took advantage of that then, dug down and found out where this old bit was with all the rubble bags. I actually found some of the areas in the mill pond where the clay was a bit deeper and skimmed some off and oh, sealed that back over idea. and did all that and rendered all up the inside of the mill pond brickwork because that was all cracked and so hopefully it should last for a few years, more years. Is that right? the, the, this the, is the sheet in the back of the front here, yeah. There, which they call the pulpit. Because the box, box, then it was lined, so it didn't leak, so you could stand in there. Otherwise, you'd have a job to reach the sheep with a long, you'd have a long pole. You could take this, this hook, be down in there, and manoeuvre the sheep about. The water would come out of this spout here yeah. onto the sheep. They would hold it under it to wash its fleece off, and it was it was just washing the fleece to get the um, the grass and the straw and bits of wood and bits of sheep poo off there, please, yeah, to yeah. clean up. It could command a better price of market then. It wasn't like your modern um, sheep digging where they use chemicals to kill bugs and things. It was just literally a, a washing to clean the fleece. Um, once they'd been washed off, they would then guide them to this channel that goes up. And as they walk, swam up, eventually their feet would touch the ground and they'd walk off into the field. It's hard to envisage now because sometime in the 60s the farmer used that field as a landfill. That ground level it would have been similar level to this. So where yeah. that just rip work came up, they would walk up and they'd be in the field once they got to this sort of level. But now it's, it's two metres high because it's been built up so it's hard to envisage it. There's a group of sheep there, lined up ready to be washed. That was that, and there's actually something ready to throw the sheep in, and you can see one or two sheep in there. But if you look, you can see the arch on the brickwork there, which is up higher than that. And you can just see the edge of the pulpit there where the chap would be standing, and the wall is just up to the up to the level of that. So the wall would have come up a good four or five feet. And uh, we've got records, I think, 1910, I think it's a thousand per sheep to be washed. Okay. When you think about it, it wasn't the case of get all the sheep into a lorry and bring them down here. They had to walk them in those days. There was no lorries or transport. So the farmer would walk with his sheep from the nearby farms, spend however many hours here washing them, and then walk them all back again. So it probably took the best part of the day to wash a few hundred sheep. Uh, and it was obviously worth their while getting more money at market, otherwise why would they bother? We've got to spend all day, we're going to get, you know, farthing more. It's not worth the effort. So it was obviously getting a better price for the ball at market by washing it, but otherwise why would they bother? That's really cool. cool. Should we walk around the mill? Yeah, sorry, the, the yeah, actual... Come around the running off of a siphon which just siphons water from the mill pond over the top of the sluice gate and it's enough to turn it and it wouldn't power the machinery. When we come to power the machinery we open up the sluice gate in that shop 
and out of the column about six inches deep all the way across and fills up the buckets almost instantly and it's got a lot more power then. Uh, it's 11 foot diameter with about 30 buckets on it. It would originally have been a cast wheel with elm or oak buckets but they were having to be replaced roughly every 10 years. So sometime in the 80s the volunteers in the event it's not the same as it was but why not put down nice metal buckets on instead because they need to hopefully they'll last a bit longer. Well, we had to replace one a couple of years back but apart from that we've lasted from the 80s now so over 40 years it originally cost less than a quarter of the price of oak so it's worked out really well although it's not the traditional wood it would have been so it's 11 foot wheel you've got a 14 foot drop between the water level there and the water level there it's what's called an overshot wheel so the water comes on top of the wheel a lot of wheels are what are called undershot where they just sit in the stream and it's just the flow of the stream that moves it here you've not only got the flow of water you've also got the weight so it's the most efficient type of wheel and it varies from undershot to what they call breast shot which comes in halfway then to the fully powered overshot wheels which are the most efficient so i've got the most efficient type of wheel there but originally it would have been either elm or oak buckets but the same shape Exactly the same shape as what they are now to catch the water that they would have just been formed. There's basically three bits of metal going in together, whereas before there would have been three bits of wood pegged in there. And that's all that's extends up to the willow tree there and just to this small sapling here which is dug out and deepened and once you get up beyond past that you've only probably got 18 inches to two foot depth of water quite shallow whereas here it's taken down to about five or six foot depth we've only probably got about four foot of water because there's two foot of mud and silt in the bottom there um, it then runs up originally ran up and then down along the back of the farmhouse down the other side of the farmhouse and we came back across here and there's what was called a moated farmhouse. Oh. Sometime when that farm was rebuilt in the 19th century and these buildings were put up, that section of the pond was blocked in along with half of it up the side so that they could then get into the farmhouse. Yeah. So it now goes just past the back of the farmhouse, up along the back and then down. Built up and built up without any overflow, it would just suddenly start flowing over the gate and turning the wheel, which you don't want. So before it gets to the level at the top of the sluice gate, it disappears over the spillway down there, which then runs down. You can see the concrete slab down there, runs down through there, round the side of the mill, and comes out just where you can see the indentation on the bank to the right. It's a two foot channel. Uh, channel sorry. I think it was 1986, me and the mill manager who was 76 at the time. He said, next week bring your shorts and some kneeling pads and a head torch or a, a reasonable torch. Okay, got here. What are we do? We're going down a tunnel to inspect it. So me and him crawled along. Wow. You, get, you crawl in water, it's two foot diameter. You crawl in six inches of water most of the way through. When you get to the end, the water level comes up you can see there's that much he said right the last 10 foot or 12 foot we've got to swim because the water level's yeah. up so we crawled through most of it and actually swam out at the end wow, there that's amazing uh, and he was 76 years old at the time and i'm thinking no I'm, i was 60 in december i'm thinking i don't fancy doing that now even though i'm 60 and he was 76 at the time but uh, it was they dug, the, they dug the ground out they laid the first half of the brickwork which when you're in the tunnel you can see it's all nicely skimmed off and nicely pointed yeah. and then they had done the top from above so when you're in there you can see all the water hanging down between the joints where they couldn't get to it to clear it off whereas the bottom half yeah, yeah, is all, all neat, nicely and neat. neat because they would did all that and scraped all the excess mortar off and almost yeah. pointed it 
and then the top, and then it was all filled back in on top of it. So there's some pictures I'll show you on the board when we go back into the pictures of the actual tunnel there. What about um, frost and, and snow? Do you have to do anything special for that? It's not too bad, but we have to be a bit careful when the if it builds up and the spillway starts getting oh, iced wow. up and blocked up. Oh, yeah, yeah, because yeah. then when it all melts and you've got all coming down from the Chilton Hills and down through the stream here, yeah. it can be a lot and it can overflow the sides. Yeah. I've got a, 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 sh a short video of that there where the water is coming over almost to the top of the brickwork. Wow. And it's coming over like a... You know, if you yeah. put your foot in there, you, it will take you away. There's so much power there, and the roar from it, the power of it going down there. And that was just when the snow had been around for two or three weeks, and then all of a sudden it all melted one afternoon or one morning. Oh, wow. That's it there. So you can see it's quite rough at the top, but all smoothed out on the bottom. Yeah. And so that's two foot diameter, so it's only when you're in there on your hands and knees, you've got to keep your head down. It's all right, and oh. yeah, it's a bit of a job to crawl all through there. But these are all old pictures of stuff that's things that have been done over the years and work that's been done. Uh, we had John Bly, John Bly come down to unveil an award that was given me, I think, 2000, shortly before I came, no, sorry, 1991, as I say, before I came down. I asked John Bly would he come down because he was starting, I think he just started doing the antique shows on TV then and mm -hmm. getting his name around nationally. Yes. So it was a kind of feather in our cap to have a celebrity down here opening the place.